Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us for our corn and soybean update. I'm Jim Minter, and joining me today are Nathan Thompson, who's an associate professor in the Department of Agricultural Economics, and Michael Langemeyer, who's professor and the associate director of the Center for Commercial Agriculture. And of course, we're doing today's webinar in light of the fact that USDA just yesterday released updated crop production estimates and updated world ag supply demand estimates. And there's quite a bit of territory to cover, so I'm going to go ahead and get started here. So um, you're looking at the numbers. Uh, USDA on the corn side did increase the corn yield estimate slightly. Uh, they pushed it up by about a half a bushel per acre compared to the October estimate. That puts that up at 177 bushels per acre. And truthfully, if you look at the trend line, that pretty much puts that yield number right on the trend line for uh, 2021. And I think one of our questions going forward, which we'll try and address a little bit later, is what's that going to look like in 2022, given some of the changes that have taken place uh, with respect to input costs, but we'll talk about that later. Um, if you look at the corn yield estimates on a state by state basis, um, it was kind of interesting. So Michael, you took a little closer look at this, uh, perhaps maybe make some comments about what took place on the state state side. Yeah, certainly there's a couple things that are very important to point out. First of all, the states we've been talking about for a long time in terms of a drought, uh, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Minnesota, they continue to increase those yields. And so they have they did that again this month. Uh, and then also worth pointing out in the Eastern Corn Belt, they, they've de decreased the yields uh, slightly. Uh, you can see in, in Illinois and Indiana, uh, the yields are lower this month compared to, to the month before. That was a little bit of a surprise. And I guess uh, when you think about what took place in the Northern part of the Corn Belt, um, maybe speaks to the resilience of these newer corn hybrids, perhaps, and the ability to tolerate some pretty tough weather conditions? I, I think that that's a very important point, Jim. Yeah. So if you look at the corn production estimate um, on an annual basis and compare that to what was taking place in prior months, not a big change. Um, USDA came in at 15.06 uh, billion bushels. That's up a little bit compared to the October number. So uh, I think an increase of about 43 million bushels so not really a big change on the supply side. If you look at the NAS estimate, USDA's estimate of the corn production number here, um, pretty much fell right in line with the trade's expectations coming into this report. Um, if you look at the individual estimates, the USDA number came in right in the middle of the estimates from the average of the uh, industry expectations, uh, the survey that's published. There's several of those different surveys and they vary a little bit, but but still pretty much in line with expectations. Um, if you look at corn exports, no change in USDA's corn export forecast for this month. Um, so that was not too much of a surprise. If you look at the export data um, in the upcoming marketing year versus the uh, in, in total commitments, so it's shipments plus the commitments for the upcoming marketing year, um, they're falling a little bit below last year's level. I think about 9% below last year's level. Um, export commitments to China actually a little bit larger uh, than last year's at this time. So that's maybe a positive, but the total commitments down just a little bit. If you compare export commitments this year versus the USDA forecast for the year, um, I guess I would characterize that as being probably pretty much in line. So we've shipped and, and have commitments for about 9% of USDA's uh, total forecast. Last year, this time, we were at about 10%. The year before, at about 9%. We've had some outlier years like 2018 and 2016, but I would characterize what's taken place so far as being more or less on target with USDA's forecast. Um, there was an increase in corn used for ethanol in terms of USDA's forecast. They pushed that up by 50 million bushels. That puts that estimate for the 2021 marketing year up to 5.25 billion bushels. That's still below where we were in 2017 and a little bit below where we were in 2018. But obviously you can see on the chart um, a significant improvement relative to the last two years. And again, that's that ramping up of economic activity and also reflecting the strength that we've seen in, in uh, gasoline prices. In fact, if you look at the estimated uh, daily ethanol plant margins, this is data coming from Iowa State University where they estimate operating margins on a daily basis for ethanol plants. Um, those are the best ethanol margins we've seen in a long, long time. Certainly much, much better than we were seeing not only last year, 
but way better than what we were seeing in 2019. So uh, the strength in ethanol prices is really making those margins pretty good. And as a result, uh, ethanol plants are running full bore. And I think that's good news uh, with respect to corn demand uh, here in, in much of the uh, central part of the Corn Belt uh, with strong ethanol demand. And if you look at the ethanol production numbers um, compared not to last year, so this chart looks at compared to 2019, it's looking at pre-pandemic, uh, we're running those ethanol production numbers on a weekly basis between nine and 10% ahead of where they were in the fall of 2019. And I think that's probably gonna continue given the strength we're seeing in gasoline prices. So that bodes well for demand for corn at the ethanol plants, uh, certainly here in the Eastern Corn Belt, and I really think throughout the Corn Belt. Um, if you look at the change in ending stocks, there was a very, very small change in USDA's projection of ending stocks. Um, so the change in usage actually outweighed the small increase in production. And so bottom line, the ending stocks are almost unchanged at, at 1.493 uh, billion bushels. Last month was 1.5. I think the bigger change though is, you know, keeping in mind how much this has changed since August. And I think that's probably the, the, the change that I think a lot of us have probably experienced with respect to the change in corn prices. Um, compared to August, we're looking at a carryover from the 21 crop to the 22 crop of about 250 million bushels more than what we were expecting back in August. So that's been the biggest change, but certainly not a big change compared to uh, last month. If you look at ending stocks as a percentage of usage, that's running uh, at about 10%. That's essentially unchanged from last month's estimate. Um, that's about not quite 2% higher than it was coming out of the 2020 crop. So, you know, if you look at it from a direction of change, the ending stocks are not going to be as tight as they were uh, coming out of the 2020 into the 2021 crop. Um, but by historical standards, you know, that thumb rule we tend to use kind of hanging around that 10%. So as long as we're not getting significantly above 10%, uh, that would argue for ending stocks in corn still being reasonably tight. Um, if you look at on a world basis, the world stocks to use ratio increased 1% from 25% uh, from last month to 26%. Um, that's not a big change, but of course you typically never do see a big change in world stock levels on a month to month basis. Um, again, the direction of change probably counts more than anything. So pointing towards just a little bit of loosening in ending stocks uh, in terms of how tight they might be. No change in USDA's uh, corn crop marketing year average price, still sitting at 545, roughly a dollar higher than coming out of the 2020 crop. Um, and, you know, really reflecting the strength in prices we've seen this fall. One of the reasons the 2020 crop estimate was as low as it was, was because prices in the fall last year were significantly weaker than they were later in the marketing year. And of course, we tend to market the largest portion of the crop in the first four to five months of the marketing year. So Nathan, you've looked, uh, as you continue to do each month, looked at storage opportunities and what those potential returns to storage might be. Let's take a look at that. Yeah, so starting off here, just looking at um, these cash forward contract bids for uh, an elevator in central Indiana and comparing those with uh, kind of an implied break even price. So essentially, uh, if you were going to forego a sale today and store, what would you need to sell for in the future uh, in order to just offset the cost incurred to, to store the crop? So uh, if you look, uh, the, the dark brown line here is the current uh, forward contract cash bids that are available at the elevator. And what you can see is uh, that line is running very, very close to um, basically my implied break-even price for an on-farm storage scenario. So essentially, if you were going to forego a cash bid today of $5.45, right, you'd incur both an opportunity cost uh, associated with storing that grain as well as a uh, storage cost here. I'm assuming one cent per bushel per month for that on-farm storage cost. And really what, what you see is that those cash bids are really right on uh, that implied on-farm storage scenario. Now, again, you want to evaluate that for your uh, own farms kind of cost structure. Uh, but based on my assumptions, that's where those numbers are. And that's really a change uh, to what we've seen in previous months uh, in terms of those cash bids being at or above uh, those implied break-even prices 
for the last several months, those have been below, those cash bids have been below those implied break-evens, indicating not a really strong incentive to store the crop. Uh, now we're seeing a little bit more incentive. And again, that's reflecting both spread in the futures market as well as uh, strength in basis. Uh, however, do notice, right, there's a, a light gold bar there as well, or line. That light gold line represents a commercial storage scenario. So if you were someone that was looking at uh, using commercial storage, and again, I'm assuming four cent per bushel per month, uh, for that, and you would want to use whatever figure would be relevant for you. We're still below that. And so um, if you were someone that was thinking about doing some storage uh, in a commercial setting, you'd want to pencil that out pretty hard in terms of comparing what those current bids are relative to what you'd need to sell for uh, in order to break even on those costs. Because right now, at least for the bids we're looking at, uh, doesn't look like there's a lot of opportunity to do that uh, and, and be able to make a return to that storage. So, so again, we've seen some improvement there uh, relative to what we've seen in previous months in terms of the strength in those forward contract bids. Uh, and we'll talk about the components that are underlying that, both the spread and the basis here in just a second. So Nathan, I guess a, a number of our viewers are probably, uh, well, probably still combining, right? Probably still trying to wrap up corn harvest. Sure. But if, uh, looking at the unpriced storage they've got. So on-farm storage hasn't been priced yet. Falling back on some of your research, um, continue to remain open on that till what, maybe Christmas or so, historically has been a pretty low risk move. Is that is that right? Yeah, that's right. So basically to the end of the year, uh, holding grain on price tends to be relatively low risk uh, in terms of the downside. As you get further and further into the new uh, calendar year, into the kind of uh, deep winter and in, in the early spring months, that tends to kind of get more and more risky and then obviously very risky into the summer months. But in terms of, you know, here to the end of the year, you know, relatively low risk to hold that grain on price. And again, you can kind of see that reflected even in the chart here where we get that bump in January of 2022 with that, you know, bid being a little bit stronger and having an opportunity to earn uh, relatively small in, in the example here, but uh, a storage return, uh, even if you were going to forward contract that that grain. Yeah, and so thinking about the risk, I mean, the risk really is probably what's going to take place on the export side because ethanol demand looks really strong. I don't see any uh, prospect for a significant weakening in ethanol demand here between now and the end of the year. Um, so, you know, if you're worried about what might happen, it would probably be on the export side, but even there over the next month or two, Odds would favor that being a pretty good move to kind of hang on and, and see what takes place, right? Yeah, for sure. So you've taken a closer look at, at basis. Let's talk about that. Yeah, so let's kind of work through a number of different things and, and kind of get a feel for what's going on in the basis side of things. So I want to start with uh, just looking at corn basis in central Indiana um, as kind of an index of, of what's going on in a kind of normal market. Uh, and we're looking at this year's uh, Corn, uh, nearby corn basis, central Indiana, that's the, the black line here. And we're looking at it relative to the three year historical average. So the average corn basis in central Indiana for the last crop marketing years. And what you can see is while we started the year with really strong, uh, started the crop marketing year with really strong basis, that quickly kind of reverted to that historical average. Um, and we've been running right along that historical average in terms of where basis has been. It looks like we probably have put in uh, our harvest lows for basis bids. It looks like they might be starting to kind of strengthen and follow a pretty uh, typical pattern that we would see this time of year. Again, we'll get a couple more kind of data points in here to say for sure. But really, it looks like uh, our, our kind of normal, uh, you know, non-river market central Indiana corn basis is kind of falling into uh, right where it, we would expect it to be based on uh, that historical average. Now, where we've been looking at this a little bit differently over the last couple of months in the webinars is what's going on, you know, in central Indiana, it looks quite a bit different than what's been going on in southern Indiana. So uh, now looking at, uh, again, corn basis in southwest Indiana, and again, this um, maybe represents a little bit more of that river market and kind of what's been going on there. And so what you can see is we started off the crop marketing year with quite a bit weaker basis, at least relative to what we were seeing in, in central Indiana at the beginning of the crop marketing year. And we've attributed a lot of that probably to what was going on at the Gulf following kind of the impact of the hurricane on some of the uh, ports down there and their ability to, to open uh, back up and get power and those sorts of things. Uh, that has continued to, to kind of weaken um, the basis there in Southwest Indiana relative to that historical average. 
even as those uh, export markets have maybe come back online and we've gotten back to normal down at the Gulf. And that probably has more to do with what's going on uh, in terms of export demand, which you uh, mentioned a little bit. And so what we've seen is that has, you know, given us weaker basis relative to that historical average there in Southwest Indiana. Again, it, it appears as though as that may have bottomed out here uh, in terms of a, a low for harvest and, and started to kind of tick back towards that historical average. I'd like to see another week's of, worth of data to kind of see if that trend is going to continue uh, back towards that, that historical average or not, but time will tell uh, what that's going to look like. And again, I think it's useful looking at that chart to then go to the next chart here, which is we started showing this last month. Uh, this is corn basis um, at a river market a little further down the river. So this is in uh, West Memphis, Arkansas. And so, you know, looking at Southwest Indiana maybe gives us a flavor for what's going on in terms of river market activity. Going further down river probably gives us a better idea of what's going on in terms of those export driven markets. And so what you can see is, again, we started off with really weak basis relative to the historical average uh, at the beginning of the crop marketing year uh, at that river market. Uh, that The trend that you see here, generally that that has been increasing uh, and again, gaining, strengthening relative uh, to that historical average or getting closer and closer to the blue line here. Now, it, I, I have to say it's been somewhat volatile and bouncing around and there's a number of things that could attribute to that, you know, one being that the crop basis tool specifically is averaging a bunch of locations in a crop reporting district. This is looking at one specific location, so that may account for some of that kind of volatility that you see there. But I would say for me, the more important thing is to look at the trend and the trend of that black line is certainly in increasing or strengthening basis uh, here over the last several weeks uh, as it relates to what's going on uh, in those export driven markets. So, you know, Nathan, when I look at those uh, charts in kind of summation, it really argues for um, kind of a normal basis pattern as we get through the rest of the fall and into the winter, right? Gradual strengthening in basis. I think at this point, that is, you know, there's certainly that's the best information that we have. Things could change. A lot of things could happen, you know, as we move forward. But as of right now, when you balance out all the competing supply and demand issues, basis is giving us a pretty normal view of what's going on in terms of uh, supply and demand um, at the local level. And so as for now, as you're forecasting or projecting out, you know, I think looking at those historical average would give you a pretty good prediction of what that um, that trend or that pattern will look like throughout the remainder of the crop marketing year until we get information to tell us otherwise. Yeah, and so you've taken a look at the ethanol plant basis as well. Yeah, so this is another one that's really interesting to kind of pile into all of the basis charts here to give us a kind of different kind of slice or different view of what's going on uh, in terms of uh, corn basis. So this is all of the ethanol plants in Indiana averaged together kind of one Indiana ethanol plant basis index, so to speak. Um, and what's interesting is again, you know, we ended the 2020-2021 um, crop marketing year with ethanol plants having really, really high basis bids uh, in the summer of 2021. You can see that reflected in the beginning of the chart here where we started the 2021-2022 uh, crop marketing year with strong basis bids and ethanol plants. That quickly kind of dropped off like we saw in some of the other charts and, and kind of reverted back towards more of a normal pattern. Um, there's a lot of other information here that, you know, you've got to kind of take in, in kind. So, you know, basis has, has been kind of wild over the last five or so years. If you think about years where we've had really strong basis associated with uh, planning issues in 2019, uh, we have really weak basis associated with COVID and the impact that that had on um, ethanol demand. So that's the red line. And so what I really want you to focus on is the black line. We've had that drop here in the first um, couple months of the crop marketing year and compare that to the blue line. And the blue line is the 2015 to 2017 average. So that would be kind of the, the I went back and tried to pick the, the three most recent normal years, if you can define anything as normal and kind of compare what's happening now to what's happening there. And so you can see it's maybe somewhat in line with that uh, 2015 to 2017 average. But I think what I would say is based on some of the information that you showed, Jim, as it relates to ethanol plant margins and demand for ethanol, that I would expect that that ethanol basis is going to continue to strengthen towards that blue line, if not kind of even past that blue line here uh, over the next little bit, given what we've seen going on at ethanol plants of late. So, I, you know, if anything, I think there's some confidence here to say that because current bids are maybe below 
um, that average. Maybe that has something to do with potential weakness in, in those export markets. The ethanol plants are getting a little bit of a, a pass there in terms of being able to get some, some corn at a little bit cheaper rate. Uh, but you know, assuming that we see exports at least continue status quo, I would say that I would expect to see some strength in ethanol plant basis as they continue to, to do well and really ramp up production. Yeah, I agree, with you, Nathan. I think the ethanol plants, as we head through the winter, are going to wind up being um, more competitive, uh, boosting their bids, um, and the margins are strong enough for they've got the incentives. But uh, it's going to be interesting to see how quickly that happens. I mean, it might take a few weeks, might take past the first of the year, but I would expect to see that creep up towards that blue line, that average that you've got projected. So you've taken a look at the futures price spreads, and that's always interesting because we have some folks that maybe had put some hedges on earlier, uh, looking at trying to lock in some storage returns. And some of those folks are thinking now about, well, is it time to roll a hedge out of Dece into one of the deferred futures contracts? And you've been tracking those spreads over time. Yeah, so we've been looking at these the last several months, again, for the exact reason that you said, for folks that have put on a hedge and are now thinking about what they're going to do as we're approaching expiration of those new crop uh, futures contracts. And what we've been saying, uh, based on some research that we've done, those spreads tend to widen uh, as we move from any sort of pre-harvest hedges that you put on maybe over the summer towards expiration of those contracts in the fall. They, they Those spreads tend to widen, so we get more... Um, uh, more of a premium for those more deferred futures contracts relative to uh, the nearby. And really the, those spreads reach their widest point somewhere in the two to four weeks leading up to expiration of the contract. So with the December contract going off the board in, in December, um, you know, sometime right about now, right? So middle to end of November is where we tend to see those spreads reach their widest point. <clears throat> and so last week I showed this chart uh, where uh, the spread between Dece and July, so Dece 21 and July 2022 uh, corn futures was 14 cents. And we were saying, you know, you've got a little bit of time here, but you want to pay attention. It's widened just a couple of cents to 16 cents. But again, we're at a point in the year where I don't expect to get too much more out of that spread. And so if you're somebody who has a hedge on in December corn futures and you're thinking about storing further and wanting to roll that hedge, you know, you want to stay on top of what's going on in these markets in terms of uh, locking in uh, a spread that uh, you feel comfortable with in terms of locking in those, those returns. Yeah, and so if you're if you're somebody that is trying to roll forward, you'd probably put an order in, uh, maybe a, a couple of cents ahead of where that spread was at today, and see if you get it hit. Uh, so, uh, but as you point out, there's not too much left. Uh, we'd be surprised if it moved very much uh, from current levels. Yeah. So you've taken a look at just uh, doing some hedging uh, in anticipation of maybe moving some corn right after the first of the year, right? Yeah. So trying to get people just an idea of what's out there in terms of cash prices, maybe after the first of the year. Uh, so we've got March 2022 corn futures today, this morning. Uh, they're, they're actually up a little bit uh, as of uh, last time I checked before we got on here. But 568, I think maybe up 10 cents or so, even since I pulled these prices, but 568 is what we'll stick with because that's what's on the slide. Um, I went to the crop basis tool for central Indiana, January delivery. You're looking at probably a basis of about five cents under. And again, based on what we're seeing in terms of uh, current basis levels, I would expect that's a pretty good forecast of what we'll see <clears throat> here over the next several months. That puts you at a, a January delivery price of $5.63, or maybe even a little higher given where futures markets are uh, since I made the slide. So, you know, that, that's a very favorable price. And so if you're someone that's looking uh, to make some decisions on marketing grain that you still have and haven't done anything with, uh, again, like we said, there's really relatively low risk in terms of um, uh, storing on price between now and the first of the year, but this would give you a little more confidence in terms of locking in that futures price. You you wouldn't have to worry about any sort of futures price risk. You'd just be speculating on basis uh, and could get to a, a pretty decent uh, $5.63 cash price for, for January delivery. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm probably a little more inclined to stay open on that maybe than you are, Nathan, but uh, given the relatively low risk environment we're in probably over the next month or two. And, and I guess I'm hanging my hat a little bit on how strong those ethanol margins are, which suggests to me we're going to continue to see some pretty strong demand from, from the ethanol production sector. So, but yeah, certainly an opportunity to start taking a look at that. Let's take a look at the soybean side now. 
Uh, USDA did reduce the uh, 2021 yield estimate by three tenths of a bushel per acre. You know, if there was a surprise on the report, I suppose this might have been it. Um, you know, I don't think very many people thought we'd see the soybean yield number come down, given the, a lot of the reports that we picked up from producers. Michael, you took a look at the uh, soybean yield estimates on a state by state basis, and uh, that was a little surprising. Similar story to corn. Uh, you know, certainly in, in that in that uh, South Dakota, North Dakota, and Minnesota, those yields have improved a little bit uh, over the last few months. Just in South Dakota this month, Nebraska also uh, saw some improvements in yield uh, compared to the previous month. I was a little surprised, Jim, uh, that they took down uh, took down the yields in Indiana and Ohio as much as they did. I um, mean, you're looking at a three bushel decrease in Indiana, and so and so that that's where some of that that yield loss occurred is in that Eastern Corn Belt. Yeah, that's what surprised me because that seemed um, a little contrary, and it's not a good sample, I realize, but uh, it was a little contrary to the reports I've been picking up from producers here in the Eastern Corn Belt, which have all been pretty darn positive. So um, if, if there was a surprise, that was it. And, and I think that tracks well when you look at the, the next chart, uh, looking at soybean production estimate coming from USDA versus the trade expectation. USDA was lower than just about anybody. Um, and that was the surprise. And then we saw an immediate reaction in the futures market when the report came out yesterday. So um, if you look at the soybean production number on an annual basis, compare it to history, uh, we were looking at coming to this report, a record high soybean crop. Now this pulls it back just a little bit. So the 21 crop is now in a tie with record large production established back in 2018. So uh, still a big soybean crop by historical standards, just not quite as big as, as people were expecting. And I think the real issue there is I think a lot of people were expecting the soybean yield number to go up on this report as opposed to coming down. So um, looking at exports, USDA pulled back their forecast by 40 million bushels compared to what they were forecasting a month ago. So they're just a little over 2 billion bushels. Um, no surprise why when you look at what's taken place so far with, resp with respect to exports, uh, the commitments are down substantially compared to this time last year. Um, so, so far to date, shipments plus commitments running 33% below last year, uh, reduced commitments to China accounting for almost 60% of that reduction in the total export commitments. So a very soft start to the export year for soybeans and USDA, I think, simply reacting to that in their, their annual forecast. And I don't have a good grip on, you know, what's going to take place here the next month or two. I think that's what the market is really trying to struggle with in terms of, you know, are we going to see a recovery and improvement in these soy soybean export uh, shipments and commitments? Um, you know, keep in mind that this is the time of year when the USDA, when the U.S. really needs to make hay with respect to export shipments, right? That's it, Roughly the first five months of the marketing year are the prime time for the U.S. to to really take advantage of its position in the market relative to South America. And so far, it doesn't look like we're doing that. So um, then if you look at the ending stocks forecast, um, again, they bumped up the ending stocks forecast coming out of the 21 marketing year into the 22, excuse me, 22 marketing year, uh, pushed it up by 20 million bushels. That puts it to 340 million bushels. And that's more than double uh, what it was back in August. And I guess, you know, in terms of keeping things in perspective with respect to what's going on in soybeans, I tend to look back to what we thought we were going to see last summer versus what we're currently projecting. And it's a, it's a much different situation uh, with a 340 million bushel carryover versus an expectation of 155 million that we had back in, in August. If you look at ending stocks as a percentage of usage, uh, that did go up this month. I think it was at 7.3% for the 21 crop last month. Now it's at 7.8%. So it's getting pretty close to that 8% mark. Again, um, you know, a little bit like we said with corn, that's still by historical standards, a relatively tight ending stock estimate. And you, when you're below 10%, that's relatively tight. But what the problem here is the direction of change. Month after month now, we keep bumping it up. As suggesting that the ending stocks are, are not as tight as we thought coming in. So uh, that's, I think, probably the biggest concern. You look at ending stocks on a world basis, not much change there. They did tighten them just a little bit. I think it came in at 27.5% versus 27.7%. So essentially flat on the world, uh, world basis. 
Uh, and then the no big surprise, I suppose, that they pulled back the marketing year average price again. Uh, this month's reduction in the marketing year average price forecast from USDA was 25 cents a bushel. So last month it was 12.35, now it's 12.10. It's still higher than last year when it was 1080 for the for the total marketing year. Um, but again, if you look at November's forecast uh, versus where it was back in August, it's down a dollar sixty. That's a big change in a marketing year average forecast in a short span of time. Uh, and so month after month, we keep pulling back that marketing year average to kind of reflect the weakness in soybeans. So Nathan, you've taken a look at bids again on the soybean side and looked at some storage alternatives. Yeah. So again. <clears throat> uh, a somewhat similar story in the sense of comparing just some forward contract bids for soybeans at a, at a <clears throat> elevator here in central Indiana relative to implied uh, break evens associated with if you're going to forego uh, $11.85 in terms of a cash price today, uh, what are you what do you need to get in order to kind of offset your storage costs there? And again, those uh, forward cash route contract bids at least you know through the end of the year into the month of January uh, are more favorable than they have looked in the past several months in terms of how they compare to those implied break evens with those cash bids just about uh, covering on farm storage costs uh, through the end of the year and into January uh, those bids are actually covering both uh, on farm as well as commercial storage costs with that twelve dollar and seven cent, cash bid for January delivery of soybeans being above uh, <clears throat> the $11.99 that you need to get to cover both opportunity costs and a four cent per bushel per month uh, commercial storage cost. So again, underlying kind of this strength in these uh, cash bids is both uh, carry in, in soybean futures markets as well as uh, an appreciation in basis or a strengthening in basis for these uh, more deferred delivery months. And so, you know, there are definitely some opportunities here to think about, um, you know, earning some storage returns for soybeans through the end of the year, just like we were talking about with corn. And again, historically speaking, that tends to be a relatively low risk strategy. It does, and certainly, and you've got over 30 years of data behind that analysis with respect to how much risk there is by store until the end of the year. I have to say though, I feel a little bit less confident on the soybean side than I do on the corn side. Uh, and the reason is the driver on soybeans is really what's going on with the, uh, the export channel. And then secondly, we're gonna talk about this later. I think the market is starting to worry about what's gonna happen in 2022 with respect to acreage. So the research on both corn and soybeans came out very similar with respect to unpriced uh, storage through the end of the year. But if you needed to move some, uh, maybe for cash flow needs, uh, maybe from a risk management standpoint, probably the one I would move at this point would probably be soybeans as opposed to corn. Do you agree with that, Nathan? Yeah, th those are great points. I mean, when you take into consideration what we know today in terms of uh, what what is on the horizon, things that we're thinking about moving forward, I think that those are, are spot on in terms of uh, thinking about the comparison between corn and soybeans. So Nathan, you've taken a look at the basis. Um, Take a look at that. Yeah, so let's talk about soybean basis. Again, let's just start in central Indiana. Uh, again, we started with uh, somewhat strong basis uh, the first couple of weeks of the crop marketing year. That quickly kind of got in line with that historical average. Again, for soybeans, I'm looking at a, a two-year historical average based on some research that a graduate student uh, that worked with me did. That tends to be the, the uh, most accurate forecast of soybean basis over, again, a long period of time. You can see, you know, that soybean basis really ran right at that historical average for, uh, you know, four or so weeks. And as we rolled to uh, the January futures contract for soybeans, right? So that first week of November, we go ahead and roll to January as uh, the nearby soybean futures contract. We see basis can dip a little bit in that last data point. And so again, it'll be interesting to see, you know, how that rebounds uh, when we get the next data point in the chart in terms of is it going to continue to uh, uh, follow uh, uh, the same pattern there, or are we going to see some weakness in soybean basis? And again, we just have to wait and see how the data shakes out to know for sure kind of what direction that's going. But don't read too much into that little dip because that does reflect a role from one futures contract uh, to the next. <clears throat> and you took a look at Southwest as well, because it's interesting to contrast what's going on in the center, central part of the state versus the river markets. 
Like, yeah, so again, looking at Southwest Indiana as a little bit of a reflection of, of the river market, which is a little bit more export driven. We started with weaker soybean basis. That's exactly the same story as corn. And again, some of that even goes back into the uh, hurricane in the Gulf uh, back in August. And so we expected to see that weaker basis. That has continued to, to uh, weaken uh, here in the surf first couple months of the crop marketing year. And again, probably driven somewhat by exports uh, as that uh, as those Gulf ports opened back up and got to normal operations for our basis to continue to weaken is probably driven by exports. Again, uh, it appears as though maybe it has put in a low and it started to strengthen. But again, that that bump up that you see from the last week of October to the first week of November still reflects uh, uh, a roll from from November to January uh, soybean futures. And so you got to be a little bit careful interpreting that, given that we're we're kind of going between two futures contracts there. But nonetheless, it'll be really interesting to get uh, the next data point, which will be on the chart uh, first thing Friday morning to kind of see, you know, are we going to see soybean basis continue to appreciate, maybe get in line with that historical average, or will we see a different pattern where we maybe see some weakness in soybean basis? Yeah, that's a good question. I guess if I had to put a put a bet on it at this point, uh, Nathan, I'd probably bet that uh, we're going to see some strengthening that we've probably seen the bottom. Do you, do you think that's the, is that the direction you lean? That's definitely the, the trend, right? Uh, nothing surprises me these days, but I think that if I had to, you know, make a guess that I would, I would expect it to maybe uh, be flat to, to appreciate a little bit. I, I wouldn't expect it to jump straight back to that historical average given um, what we saw. But again, you know, we saw uh, a decrease in soybean yields. And so maybe that was enough uh, to kind of get those cash prices up a little bit and, and get basis more in line with that historical average. We'll see. You took a look at the river market on uh, farther south on soybeans as well. Yeah, and again, you know, same kind of story here where we see the weakness in basis early in the crop marketing year, further down the river, driven by uh, those export markets being uh, inhibited by, you know, lack of power and, and some damage to, to those uh, ports on the Gulf. The, the most important thing to look at here, though, I think is the trend over the last four to eight weeks, four to six weeks. And that has been a, a strengthening of, of soybean basis uh, on those river markets. Again, a little bit volatile in terms of being up and down, but the trend overall is for it to kind of be following that historical average. It's above and below, depending on the week. Uh, and again, if you look at this chart, I think there's a lot more evidence to think that there's probably going to be a continuing appreciation in soybean basis. And so maybe if we extrapolate this and move it back to some of the uh, charts that we showed in Indiana, you could maybe build an assumption that we think we'll see some you know, steady, not anything crazy, just some continued steady appreciation uh, in those basis patterns here over the next couple of weeks. Yeah, and for some of our viewers that might be, get, be getting excited looking at this bl uh, blue line on your chart, keep in mind that does have the uh, 2020 crop numbers in it, which pulled that average up pretty sharply. So if you took that 2020 out, it'd pull those numbers down. You'd probably still see the same trend, but not as strong of an increase. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. So, the spreads have changed. You've looked, taken a look at those soybean futures uh, price spreads as well. Yeah, so we've reached the point now, you know, just a couple of days, the, the November soybean futures contract will go off the board. But I thought this was useful to show because, again, we've been talking about this for a couple of months now, looking at those spreads. Uh, and for folks that maybe have placed some hedge earlier, hedges earlier in the year and are now looking at what to do with those uh, positions in terms of potentially rolling them forward to a more deferred futures contract, uh, we've been saying again for soybeans specifically, you know, the last four or so weeks, which is basically the month of October, is when those spreads tend to reach their widest point for that November soybean futures contract. Uh, and so I believe uh, last month we showed this chart, and the spread between November and July was uh, 37 or 38 cents, somewhere in there. And so um, we've seen that widen even a little bit more, right? Maybe another nickel. Uh, but again, uh, there, there is some downside risk, I guess, as you as you get into the delivery month uh, associated with those futures contract this year. If you, for whatever reason, didn't take our advice, which was you know based on our research, you know you could have picked up again another nickel or so uh, as that has widened out. But uh, again, you'd want to do something with that position here in the next couple of days as, as that November contract goes off the board. Yeah, and a lot of folks might have waited to maybe the, like the last week of October and probably picked up a good chunk of that nickel or six cents or so that we're talking yeah. about. So yeah, that's a good point. Um, and and there's always some uncertainty with respect to the exact day you should roll those, right? There's 
there's enough variability from year to year that you know the trend is is one thing, but year to year variability can catch you a little bit, right? Sure, and it's yeah, it's not an exact science, right? I think the 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 big point is if for whatever reason you you were looking at that when we were talking about it in the the middle of October, that thirty seven cent spread, if you went ahead and locked that in, I mean that was that was very favorable and, and a good a good decision to take. It just so happens that there might have been a few more cents to be had, but I, I would feel good about having rolled that, you know, at that thirty-seven cents. That was a very favorable spread to lock in, uh, in, in historical standards. So, yeah, it was a great gain relative to uh, somebody that might have placed a hedge into the deferred right. last spring or early summer, right? So a huge, uh, nice return there. Um, so you took a look at some pricing for some January delivery. Yeah, so again, just looking at, you know, what we could be looking at in terms of a January delivery of soybeans. So March 2022 soybean futures today uh, at about $12.22. I think they were up, again, maybe 10 cents, a little less than that, seven or eight cents since I made the, the slide this morning. Uh, so you may be a little bit stronger than what you see there. Um, expected soybean basis for central Indiana, again, just using the crop basis tool, about 10 cents under for January delivery. I put you at a cash price of about $12 and 12 cents. Again, maybe 12.15 to 12.20 if you look at uh, the, the strength in futures markets this morning. Uh, and so again, that's a, a pretty reasonable price to be thinking about. And so you gotta be thinking, you know, if you've got corn that you haven't done anything with, are you gonna store it on price? Again, we've said relatively low risk, maybe for soybeans, uh, like you mentioned, we've got some, some factors that are influencing um, uh, the demand side that we might want to uh, think about in terms of whether or not we're willing to take that risk. But in either case, uh, that's that's kind of what the opportunities look like right now over the next couple of months. All right, so let's turn to uh, Michael Langemar. Michael, uh, you're the guy in the hot seat right now because everybody's trying to figure out what does this tremendous rise in production cost mean not so much for 2021, but for 2022. I'll let you talk about that a little bit. Yeah, again, 2021 looks pretty strong because remember we were dealing with a lot lower input costs uh, when we were making uh, choices regarding the 21 crop and, and you know buying that seed, buying that fertilizer, and so and so the the higher input costs really didn't impact uh, the income in 21, and so that remains relatively strong. It's come down a little bit from what we were projecting a few months ago, but. Uh, certainly $400 uh, per acre uh, net return to land is really strong. And so that, that one's really not going to change that much. And so uh, 22, however, has really eroded. Uh, we, we were always comparing 22 to 2020 and thinking maybe it would be similar to 20, 2020. I'm kind of throwing that out the window now uh, because of the very high input costs. And, and now it looks like we won't even be as high as, as potential cash rent. And this is only assuming a 5% increase in cash rent. And so net return to land with the current cost structure, which may not, which may be overly optimistic, we'll get into the some of the assumptions I've made there. Looks like net return to land is slightly lower uh, than cash rent in 22. And so as you're negotiating cash rents for the next couple of years, keep this chart in mind. Yes, 21 very strong incomes would suggest that uh, there's some upward pressure in 22, but just keep in mind with these higher input costs, we're not looking at at, at very good earnings uh, in 22. So Michael, you know, on the barometer surveys, we've been asking people that produce corn and soybeans the last few months, what they think is gonna to happen to cash rental rates in 2022 versus 2021. And on the last survey, the October survey, we did see a little bit of a change. So prior to that, we were seeing just about 50% of the people telling us they expected to see cash rents go up in 22 versus 21. This last month, last month that came down a little bit to I think 43%. So, we didn't put a question mark on your previous slide. It does look like cash rent rates are going to go up in 2022 for most people, at least on average, um, but maybe a little less upward pressure than what we were talking about, say, two months ago, right? Definitely, definitely the case. I, I think more like 5%. I think that 5% that I've used here is actually more realistic than some, something in the double digits, 10% or higher. All right, so keep uh, care. You, you've done some net farm income projections as well. Yeah, just to kind of continue the same same theme here. I mean, this is looking at net farm income rather than net return to land, and so and the difference here is I don't have the opportunity costs included uh, in net farm income, and so this is this is 
Uh, this is really looking at uh, the nitty gritty uh, when you're looking at financial performance, when you're looking at net farm income. And it's the same story. Uh, we were hoping that 22 was going to be similar to 20. Uh, that's certainly not the case with this higher, higher input cost. It's not that prices have changed that much or price projections have changed that much. It's these higher input costs is really taking that net farm income down uh, below this long run average, which is the red line in this chart. Yeah, so looking at your chart, Michael, you've got it back in the ballpark of what we were at in say, what, 2016, 2018, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, thanks for pointing that out. It's, it's, it's kind of, kind of uh, not very pretty picture there. So one of the big drivers, and I think most of our viewers are already aware of this, but we wanted to put a chart in to kind of show it, uh, it fertilizer prices have just skyrocketed. Um, USDA puts out a report every two weeks called the Illinois Production Cost Report, where they track prices, uh, both the high, the low, and the average uh, price for various fertilizer inputs. And, and we just put a chart in here for the uh, anhydrous ammonia prices. And if we've got the average, the high, and the low for each month. So we've averaged those weekly reports and or biweekly reports into av monthly averages. But um, it, the numbers are shocking. I mean, I, that's all, real, all you can say. That high price, I think, on the uh, for the last report here in early November for anhydrous ammonia was thirteen hundred and fifty dollars a ton, and you know that's a stunning price uh, for anhydrous ammonia. Um, so, with that thought in mind, Michael, you've taken a look at fertilizer and seed costs on a per acre basis, right, or yes. per bushel basis. Now, this includes both uh, phosphorus, potash, and nitrogen, and so all of those costs are included here. And, and, the, and the sad story about uh, fertilizer prices is it's not only anhydrous ammonia that's went up, it's, it's both phos phosphorus and potassium. Uh, potash has also seen some rather large increases, and, and so that's incorporated in this chart. And what I wanted to do here is compare, compare back to 2013. 2013 was also a year where we had relatively high fertilizer costs. If you look at the last 15 to 20 years, we're blown through, uh, you know, the, the cost per bushel of what we were seeing uh, in 2013 using current, using the current uh, prices in the Illinois uh, uh, crop production report. So, Michael, just for and we're looking at cost per bushel of dollar thirty-five, dollar forty, which is is very high. Uh, it's not only compared to last year, but also compared to that two thousand thirteen. So, Michael, you've been looking at this from a long-term perspective as well, not just the last couple of years. I don't think we've ever seen a, a rise in production cost as rapid as what and as large as what we've seen here just these last few months. Do you, do you agree with that? It's definitely unprecedented, particularly for corn. Uh, we're looking at break-even prices for corn that are that are over 15% higher from 21 to 22. That's extremely large. I mean, you see 5% once in a while, something in that in the ballpark of 5%, but 15% is just unprecedented. Uh, when you look at soybeans, it's not quite as big. Uh, there, it's closer to 10% because nitrogen is really impacting corn in, in, a, in a very big way, of course. And, but, but both of those very large increases compared to compared to uh, uh, you know the last couple of decades at least and perhaps further than that. All right, so uh, you've taken a look at some uh, corn nitrogen rate application rates, right? Yeah, this is using the N rate calculator, which is available on the Iowa State website, and and uh, uh, the folks here at Purdue, the agronomists at Purdue, uh, have input to this calculator, and so uh, different land grant schools get together and 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 and, and, and uh, uh, submit information to this calculator. So I encourage uh, producers and, and others uh, to take a look at this. It's very useful. What I've done here is I've looked at the estimates for Northwest and North Central Indiana. Uh, and so those there is other regions of Indiana that you can plug into the N-rate calculator in addition to Illinois, Iowa, uh, and other states. And so what I've, I've looked at here is the 35 cents uh, a, a dollar per pound of N. Uh, obviously, we're not expecting that for 2022, but that's what it was uh, in the spring of 2021. So that's why I've got that in the chart here. And if we look at, at nitrogen prices last spring, we were looking at an optimal N rate for uh, Northwest, North uh, Central Indiana of 194 uh, pounds of N, a maximum yield of 100%, uh, and anhydrous ammonia cost of $68 per acre. Now we're closer to that 80 cents uh, per pound of N. We're not quite there yet, but we're getting close. That's about $1,300 per ton. I've used $1,200 per ton in, in some of my estimates uh, in, in these slides, but uh, certainly on the high end, we're busted through that $1,300 uh, 
uh, Jim, on, on that report. Uh, it, with, with 80 cents, we're looking at an optimal end rate uh, that's over 20 pounds lower. Uh, despite that lower optimal end rate, it's only having a 2% impact on maximum yield. And, 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 so, and so it's not having a tremendous impact on yield, but you do see some yield declines uh, with, the, with that higher, higher nitrogen price. And, and with that, uh, the anhydrous ammonia cost per acre uh, jumps to $135 per acre. Uh, just as kind of a frame of reference here, uh, if you look at average productivity soil, uh, this is just a huge number. You're looking at total fertilizer cost close to $250 per acre. This is just looking at the anhydrous portion uh, of that. And so this is just shocking. Uh, when you take a look at the slide and compare where we were last spring uh, compared to where we're at right now. And then you've gone ahead and taken a look at the difference in earnings per acre. Yeah, this is our, our standard chart we've been showing here for the last several months and corn just keeps looking better uh, because uh, corn prices have, have, have shown some strength uh, you know, you know, uh, recently compared to soybean prices. And here I'm talking longer than just yesterday. Obviously, soybean prices reacted positively to the WASI report yesterday. Uh, but uh, corn looks a lot better in 21. Uh, part of that is a uh, you know uh, relatively strong yields in Indiana uh, for corn uh, in in 21. 22, you can't even see. Uh, you can't even see that there's a bar there, but it's really the same. Uh, you know, if you look at projected prices for 22, you you incorporate a, a cost structure. Uh, it looks like there's about the same uh, potential earnings for both corn and soybeans. Now, I did want to point out, I, I mentioned it, uh, that, that I'm using a hydrous ammonia prices of $1,200 per ton uh, in, in this chart. So that's what I've been using uh, to create this chart. And, you know, obviously end prices, uh, end costs could be higher than that. And so, Michael, I think that's really going to be the crux of the issue here, not just today, but all winter long. I think we're going to be debating um, corn versus soybean acres uh, in 2022. And so, you know, one, one of the challenges is going to be not just, as you pointed out, just the nitrogen, but looking at the total picture and whether or not people are willing to more likely to plant uh, soybeans on acres where they're having trouble getting fertilizer supplies. Because, you know, when I look at your prior slide, Michael, and, and looking at those maximum uh, profit uh, nitrogen rate applications, I think it's a little surprising to think that you could essentially double nitrogen price and only pull back the optimal rate a little over 10%. Um, that tells me that the issue in the spring uh, is probably gonna be availability. And that's one of the concerns I think people are gonna have is whether or not they're gonna have the ability to actually get the nitrogen that they want because at, at 171, that's still a lot of nitrogen, right? Um, yeah. And so the challenge is going to be, are you going to be able to get it? And can you get it in a timely fashion? Yeah, and, and there's another really tough decision there. Uh, do, you want to use, do you want to use similar rates to what you've used in the past on your corn acres? Therefore, if you have less nitrogen, am I going to plant less corn acres? Or am I, am, am I going to cut back that nitrogen like we've showed in that chart there uh, and spread that over more corn acres? And so there's going to be some real tough decisions there uh, possibly, uh, and how you ration that and the nitrogen you can get uh, on the corn acres. Yeah, good point. All right, you've looked at uh, break-even prices by land productivity category. Yeah, just real quickly on the break-even prices, again, using the $1,200 uh, anhydrous ammonia per ton. Uh, we're over $5 on the average productivity and right at uh, you know, 515 approximately on the high. 475. Again, we were below $4 uh, in 21 uh, in terms of our break even price on high productivity. Now we're at 475. If you plug in $1,500 and hydrous ammonia, which is certainly possible, uh, you know, given where, given where we're at, you know, that break even gets very close to $5, right at about 495. Uh, and, and so we're, we're looking at break even prices, even on very high quality soil uh, of close to $5. Five dollars per bushel. I, I didn't think I would see this. Uh, if you'd asked me this uh, last year at the same time, I said, "Oh, no way. That's not that possible." Well, here we are. Uh, you know, close to five dollar uh, uh, per bushel break-even prices for corn. Yeah, I think that's worth repeating, Michael. So coming into the 2021 crop year on high productivity soil, you had a total cost break-even of less than four dollars a bushel. Oh yeah, it was it was down to three eighty five, three ninety. Uh, you know, so for some folks. 
or potentially a putting close to five dollars. Potentially putting a dollar a bushel increase yeah. on corn production cost in from one crop year to the next. I that's absolutely unprecedented. Um, that's why our returns for 22, the, the, the prospects of getting anywhere as close to 21 is just not there. Uh, you'd have to look at some pretty extreme uh, cases uh, of corn demand and, and corn supply uh, to get us anywhere close to the profitability uh, that we saw in 21. That, that's probably obvious, but I wanted to state that. So you've looking at break even prices beans. for soybeans as well. And, and yeah, it's, it's not a similar just... story for soybeans over $11. Uh, a uh, break-even price on the high productivity soil. And, and we were well below dollars last year uh, for soybeans on high productivity soil, right at $12 uh, per bushel uh, for, uh, for for uh, the average productivity soil. Uh, and when you start looking at prices, that's actually what I'm attempting to do with the green bar there. You can see that it's about break-even on average productivity uh, and, 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 and high productivity both, and, and, and with a little more earnings on the high productivity, but the earnings aren't very big. Uh, if, if you take a, a close look at, uh, at, at those charts, and so and so, you're looking at at, at uh, maybe break even at best uh, on average in high productivity soil right now. So the next couple of charts are always interesting. Ones we more typically use as we approach planting season, but this year is unique. So it's uh, an opportunity to start thinking about what kind of prices would you need relative to corn and soybeans in terms of shifting your acreage, right? Yeah, before I discuss these charts, one of the reasons why we're putting some of these charts in there is we've heard a lot of, we've heard from a lot of people, Jim, that uh, that corn is gonna be down rather substantially. And so some pessimism regarding corn, if you will. And I'm usually very bullish when it comes to soybeans. And so, and so this, this is, but this is unusual for me. I'm, I, I, I think, I, I want to make a statement. I don't think you want to give up on corn, even with those very high nitrogen prices. If you can afford to put the crop in, I mean, you're obviously going to have higher operating loans, but if you can afford to put the crop in there, uh, you know, take a close look at your corn budget and your soybean budget. Uh, even with these higher costs, corn is hanging in there uh, on, in, in the rotation. Now, certainly from a continuous corn standpoint, uh, corn does not look like a very good option. Uh, I sound like a broken record on this one. I mean, I've been talking about this for several years now uh, on some of these webinars. And this just hasn't looked very good uh, for a long time. And so we don't need to spend much time on this chart. We're not likely to see the corn prices uh, you know, that, that I'm showing here for $12 soybeans uh, to encourage us to grow continuous corn. But moving to the next chart, if we look at uh, second year soybeans versus rotation corn, that's a different story. I mean, certainly if you look at projected prices, even with a, a basis of 20, 25 cents uh, in the fall of 20, 2022, you're looking at, 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 at corn that's just as uh, solid uh, in terms of earnings as, as soybeans, both on average productivity soil and high productivity soil. And so this is one of those times uh, where you really want to do a, uh, do, do a good job of looking at your corn budget and soybean budget and using that information along with projected prices uh, to, make the, to make an intelligent uh, decision, corn versus soybeans. And I think that's a, the, really the key point, Michael, and this is going to change over time, right? So uh, here we are in November. Uh, this is something you're going to have to monitor during the course of the winter to see how this shakes out and, and get a little better grip on it as we approach planting season. But um, I, I think your message is on target with respect to don't just look at these high fertilizer prices and automatically throw in the towel on corn. Um, it's going to be a, a decision you're going to have to debate during the course of, of the winter and, and then maybe even to the early part of the spring. Um, so I, I thought it'd be useful, though, to think about this a little bit, because this is the talk that's kind of floating around the commodity markets. And that is, you know, what kind of an acreage shift we might see. And, and um, you know, I don't think at this stage anybody knows, right? Uh, we, we haven't seen a situation like this, so we really don't have a good uh, analogy, uh, kind of a year that we can look at. Um, the question mark is going to be, we're, we're almost assuredly, I think, going to see a reduction in corn acreage in 2022 versus 2021. The question is the magnitude. Is it going to be a small change or is it going to be a large change? Uh, last year, 2021, we planted 93 million acres of corn. On the soybean side, uh, we planted 87 million acres of corn. I've seen some estimates, and you probably have as well, suggesting that those two could wind up being about a 50-50 split in 2022. That'd be a big change uh, relative to history. Um, 
So I'm not willing to say what's going to happen there, but I think it's it's something we're going to have to monitor pretty closely. Um, and and I think your your point is really well taken, Michael, and the fact that it's always good to look at those budgets and and do accurate projections for the upcoming crop year. This is really a year where you've got to pay attention uh, pretty closely. And production costs are going to vary across people because some people, for whatever reason, were able to do a little better job of locking in some lower input prices than other folks. Um, there's still a lot of uncertainty with respect to what uh, uh, pesticide prices are going to be. Uh, they are up substantially, we know that, but we don't know the magnitude. There's also some uncertainty with respect to availability. So those are all issues that are going to get a shake out over time. And I guess I can't help but give a little bit of a plug for the upcoming Top Farmer Conference. Uh, this will be one of the topics that we address at the Top Farmer Conference. We've invited and have uh, uh, several of our production scientists uh, from Weed Science and, and the Department of Agronomy participating with us this year. So we'll have a chance to talk about uh, not only the impact of, of those prices on, on cost of production, but also some management strategies, particularly as we struggle with availability of, of uh, uh, various inputs. So with I that- I want to circle back, Jim. I want to circle back, Jim, to what you were saying earlier. And if, and if I understood you right, uh, you're somewhat more optimistic of, with related to corn exports uh, compared to soybean exports. Is, is that the case? Well, it's certainly been the case so far. And, uh, you know, what the place on the soybean side hinges so heavily in what China does, and to some extent, corn does as well. Uh, but the, the corn export picture here, these first nine weeks of the marketing year have been substantially more positive than what we've seen on the soybean side. The other positive for corn continues to be what's going on, on the ethanol side. Very, very strong demand for corn. So when you look at that picture, um, again, I think that reinforces your comment. Don't throw in the towel on corn just yet. And then also, we, we talked about this yesterday or maybe the day before, uh, this fertilizer shortage and, 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 and herbicide and insecticide shortage uh, is, is worldwide. This is not just a U.S. situation. So it's going to be very important to see, to look at what Brazil does in terms of corn acreage and the amount of fertilizer they use on that corn, ac corn acres, but also Ukraine and Russia. You know what what they decide to do you know usually when you look at ukraine and russia they they tend to have more capital constraints than we do uh in eu and brazil argentina and the us and so it'll be interesting if they if they switch some of their corn acres to wheat acres or something like that and so and so this and so i wanted to make that point that the, these things that we're talking about with input costs this is a worldwide situation yeah that's that's a very good point so We'll continue to monitor this closely. We'll be discussing it at the upcoming webinar, which is going to be a little later. We've got a, a little bit of a delay relative to the uh, December WASD report in December. Uh, we're planning on broadcasting the webinar from the Indianapolis Farm Machinery Show uh, on December 15th. Uh, but it should be a live stream if you're not able to attend the show. But if you're at the show, you should have an opportunity to visit with us in person. We're looking forward to that. Uh, so. And of course, we have the Top Farmer Conference coming up. That is on January 7th. And there'll be more details on both of those available at our website, purdue.edu slash commercial ag. And so with that, on behalf of my colleagues, uh, Nathan Thompson and Michael Langermeyer, I want to say thanks for joining us. And on behalf of the Center for Commercial Agriculture, I'm Jim Minter.